Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Confessions of a Gamer. This is going to be part one of a two-part series, and the reason for doing this is because I've been asked by uh, Forgotten Forge Games as a group, uh, as opposed to just myself, Voice of the Forge, uh, in order to do uh, a little bit of commentary on the state of play with Magic the Gathering. But before I do this, I thought it would be an interesting idea to actually have a look at what one of the most influential games has been over the last 20 years. People um, are instantly recognising what Magic the Gathering is, even if they've never played. It's one of those games where so many people have heard of it, but they've never played it. It has reached the same kind of iconic status that Dungeons and Dragons did during the height of the Satanic Panic in the late 1980s in America. And in some cases, this is still lumped in with games like Dungeons and Dragons as being evil and of the devil because it involves spells and, of course, the titular magic. It is worth recognising that those of us who have been around since the game's inception, indeed I have been playing since the revised era, uh, know that uh, Richard Garfield, who is the inventor of the game, originally came up with the idea to save a failing gaming company and they'd done other games before, games like Robo Rally. And it was such a spectacular success that the Alpha and Beta card sets sold out very, very quickly and had several reprints. Those of us who were lucky enough to get in near the ground floor can remember the Arabian Nights set being uh, sold, uh, which was under the title of Antiquities. And that was seen in a couple of streets in the UK. Uh, most noticeably in what was then Electronics Boutique. And straight away that then dates when this game came about. But I didn't start playing until Revised, because that was when we had our own uh, version of the friendly local game store. When people didn't really know what they were, and uh, the people who were interested in these kind of games already flocked there for things like Warhammer and Dungeons and Dragons. This was the kind of shop we got our fix from in other ways and with the introduction of this new card game uh, interest rocketed because it was simple, it was clear, you could get your hands on the cards and you could build your own decks. And of course this was way before um, what we would consider standard deck sizes and everything else used to be, where you'd play with as many cards and as many colours as you felt you could get away with. Although it didn't take long for the standard 60 card format to evolve, uh, it was one of those things which wasn't apparent at the beginning. One of the things that people, many people may not realise as well was when the game was first imagined that of your deck one of the cards would be picked at random uh, and put aside by each player and the winner of the game would actually win those cards. So uh, you actually had game uh, cards within the original sets uh, up until I believe revised, I think they took them out in fourth, where you would actually ante one of your cards in your deck and uh, you would therefore lose that card if you lost the game. Uh, this quickly proved to be unpopular with people just playing for fun and so that rule uh, was eventually uh, terminated and so did the run of cards uh, which had an effect on cards that were anteable or uh, cards which uh, changed the way in which the ante worked. And it goes to show just how popular the game was that people didn't want to lose their cards. I can remember uh, reading in one of the in-house publications when Magic was first given its tap patent. Uh, and it was given it for 20 years. And there was a long discussion at the time as to whether or not this would be sufficient or whether the game would outlast its trademark. And many people at the time had the consensus that it would actually fold well before the 20 years was up. And of course, we're now into something like the 23rd or 24th year and we're still going strong. 
One of the biggest problems that Magic now faces, however, and this is what we'll be addressing in another video, is the way in which it has now become a hobby in which you have to invest not only enormous amounts of time, but also enormous amounts of money. And this is not a good thing for any hobby system. If we look at the recent changes made to Games Workshop and the rebranding of their stores to Warhammer, and the fact that uh, the change in CEO has markedly and rapidly changed the fortunes of the company to one uh, which a couple of years ago was on its knees. It was barely surviving. And this is from the game that most people uh, have heard of globally uh, to the extent where they rebranded their stores to the name of their best-selling product. Uh, we actually have an issue where the company had gone from being one of the biggest players in the market to being only just surviving. With the ousting of the then CEO who was uh, in charge of the company during the fiasco with aftermarket parts in America where they actually lost several key uh, trademark and copyright uh, uh, um, claims in a US court. Uh, the new CEO has rapidly turned things around and has made it easier for new people to get into the game. And I believe that something along this line now has to happen with Hasbro. Uh, it was one of the good things that happened to Wizards of the Coast when they bought out TSR as a failing company. Uh, and you could see Games Workshop going the same way. Uh, and then Hasbro, uh, although uh, Wizards of the Coast never looked like failing, Hasbro bought them out and increased their uh, market share uh, quite a bit. Some of the decisions they've taken with regard to uh, the way in which the game is marketed have been good, uh, others have not been so good. But this was just uh, a retrospective, just to look back at the fact that this is a game that has been going for longer than some people have been alive. There are people that are in their 20s that were not born when this game was created. And that's quite a scary thought. That means that it has become one of the stalwarts of the industry, much like Dungeons and & Dragons and other role-playing games. Uh, uh, and one of the things that I have been disheartened with, whilst I thought it was a great idea at the start, was the D20 system, because it made uh, games very uh, quick to pick up and then other games started copying the formula becoming d20 systems and it robbed some of the games of some of their uniqueness because they no longer had an independent uh, flavorful rule set dark heresy um, changed that somewhat with having a d100 system and other games uh, generally tend to fall into the d20 format now rather than the uh, existing formulas which we now have. It is interesting to note as well that when Magic that came out there was an explosion of other games that came out too. Uh, some of them are no longer with us. Uh, some of these would be things like Parrots of the Spanish Main which was uh, a card game that, which was cards that you collected and then you built them up into little ships uh, but you bought booster packs and starter packs in pretty much the same way in blind packs. Uh, in fact, the blind pack model was somewhat revolutionary and has been in, uh, used in various other uh, items such as Lego minifigures. And with this, we've also had the um, market bubble, as it were, expand and contract in the past, and Magic was one of the survivors. Uh, with, yeah, uh, games such as Rage. Uh, the original game was called Jihad, which is another Richard Garfield game, got changed to Vampire um, and still kept the body line The Eternal Struggle uh, because of um, connotations that Jihad had uh, and it seems somewhat prescient that this decision was taken a long time ago. It was a shame that the uh, game didn't last because the World of Darkness series, uh, that White Wolf uh, produced was in fact a very good storyteller system. In fact the storyteller system still exists in some way shape or form uh, but again it was something that had a unique flavour 
and made it uniquely theirs. There, there were uh, games for uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Forgotten Realms had spell, uh, spell, bound, spell. Yes, yeah, something along those lines. And I can, I can spend, uh, I, I can talk about many, many um, hours spent playing that game, as well as another one, uh, which was Blood Wars, which uh, focused on. Uh, demons and devils and their war uh, in the Planescape setting of the uh, Dungeons and Dragons universe. Uh, there, there, there were untold games. There was a Xena game. Uh, if, if, the, if, if there was a title at the time, such as wrestling or action, there was somewhere a card game that came out and there was a glut on the market and unfortunately not everybody could. Um, afford to get into every game not everybody could afford the time to learn the new rules and you certainly couldn't afford to buy all of the booster packs all of the starter kits and everything else that came about uh, Pokemon was one of the early successes that is still around as well uh, this is another game that has been going for a lot longer than people realize and is now something of a classic uh, it, it's you can still buy the cards for it as well um, Yu-Gi-Oh uh, came about not too long after uh, as well and it is thanks to games like Magic that we have other successful card games that are still going. Other games uh, tried a slightly different model uh, if you were interested in Marvel or DC uh, it was a fairly common practice uh, to see uh, hero clicks and uh, assorted similar games <clears throat> on the shelves as well and these again followed the blind pack formula where you got a random rare and random other uh, ad adventurers to make up your team uh, again this was also copied by uh, the Dungeons and Dragons universe and has had significant reboots and one of the more successful ones at the time were the Star Wars miniatures game which is now somewhat changed and morphed into what we now have as attack wing and th games like that so you can see that there's been a direct progression uh, in some games from the Magic the Gathering model all the way through to some of the games that we, that we have now which have morphed and changed over time. Obviously uh, these are the winners that we're talking about and there were so many of these games that I can't remember all of them. I mean Star Trek had various uh, 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 movie spin-offs with the next generation and some of the other bits and pieces and they did extremely well for a time Star Wars had um, more than one uh, games uh, set uh, and it now lives on with the living card games uh, from uh, Fantasy Flight uh, and alongside those you also have Netrunner uh, there's a Star Wars one there's the Game of Thrones all these at one time or another have been trading card games that now focus the collectability in a different way where instead of having a blind pack you know what you're getting from the uh, set and you are using those to expand card, uh, expand, expand a game based on knowing that you are getting certain cards so you can change the deck in the game a certain way and this is also um, alongside the living card game have been the deck building and dice building kind of card games uh, so you can see that the market fragmented from all having a similar sort of model into these new models where we now have the, the living card game model uh, where you buy sets of cards um, the the munchkins of the universe and everything else uh, whereas at one point we all used to have a similar market model which is the blind pack and the other uh, starters kits and everything else that you'd have with it so we still have that golden age even though we went through a crash where a lot of these games failed they th as time has gone on they have either been rebooted or remade in a slightly different way which appeals to people but not having the same impact on their wallet to enjoy the games and to have uh, the enjoyment for many hours of these games so this has been a quick look at the history of magic and where the market has been and in the next video we will be looking at a discussion that has been made again it will be me talking but this is something that we have written down and uh, discussed between ourselves over a period of time uh, so this is a group more of a group consensus kind of thing 
uh, but I just wanted to get certain things off my chest so that I wouldn't then derail that later on. So I thank you for listening to uh, this Confessions of a Gamer, uh, part one of two, and I hope that you uh, enjoy it, uh, uh, like it, and subscribe if you wish to uh, hear more content of this nature. I am, as always, a voice of the forge. You can find me on Twitter and YouTube, and on Player Me where you'll also find our uh, Twitch channel, which due to technical issues we haven't been able to stream anything yet, uh, but we will be looking at doing so soon. And if the uh, rules on Twitch continue to tighten, we are looking at Beam and Hitbox. So thank you very much for listening. I hope this has been informative, and I hope that you will uh, like to hear more, inf more information and more product from us in the future. Thank you for listening.